that which is not good for the beehive cannot be good for the bees. Marcus Aurelius. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone who's been listening, and for any newcomers, welcome. Uh, I hope you've had a good last week, and uh, that your January was a nice slow return to normal after, of course, a generally busy holiday season. Um, so I hope uh, hope you're back in the swing of things now that February is here. Um, but this week, for the podcast, we're going to be talking about another site located in the Anatolian Peninsula, uh, Chatelhoyuk. Uh, and this may take a couple of episodes, though I don't know if it'll be quite as many episodes as we had for um, the Tos Tepler culture in Gobekli Tepe. We'll just have to see how long it takes me to ramble through uh, the information I've gathered uh, yeah, for, uh, for this site. Um, also, I would like to thank for the couple of people who reached out uh, and gave me some advice on Turkish pronunciations. I'm going to try to keep those in mind uh, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I, I do thank you and uh, I'll try to keep practicing on those. And if I've made a mistake, please forgive me. Uh, and if you come up with any other tips, please let me know. So, uh, Chatelhoyuk is located around 350 miles to the west of Gobekli Tepe, which is around 560, 65 kilometers. Um, and that is if you are walking in a straight line, or I guess as the crow flies, between those two places. Something the geography of the area doesn't allow for in reality. Um, today, barring a plane ride, which of course would be a straight shot, uh, the shortest car ride between the two would take around uh, 454 miles or about 725 mile, uh, kilometers. So, um, and I'll cover the topography that leads to this. Uh, Chatelhoyuk is located about eight miles south of the modern city of Konya, or as it is known in antiquity, Iconium. Now this city is located on the Konya Plain. Uh, this is a fairly large, mostly flat land, though it does have some hills, um, on kind of like the larger plateau of the peninsula that kind of is in the center west. Uh, to the south you have though the central Taurus Mountains and Kanya is close to a couple of large passes to get through the mountains to the hills and coastal plains of the southern part of the peninsula. Um, as well as other parts of the peninsula to the west but that's not the Taurus Mountains that's a different range. Basically Kanya is a nice central hub to reach the southern half of Anatolia. Uh, Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey and is north of Konya, is kind of the same but for the northern half of the peninsula. And that's a little bit of a simplification, but that's the easiest way to think of it. Uh, though the area most related to the sites we have already covered so far is around the modern city of Adana. And if you were leaving Konya to the south or southeast, you would emerge into the hills and coastal plain around Adana. Uh, this is how you would reach the coast of the Levant. And if you traveled further east from where Adana is now, you would get to the headwaters of the Euphrates. And then continuing east, you get to the northern Mesopotamia region, uh, the area where the Tas Tepler sites are. And then further east, you get to the headwaters of the Tigris River. Um, but I'm getting a little off topic. And But this is an important route for migration and trade. And it, it will come up again later. So just keep all this in mind. Uh, Çatal is the Turkish word for fork. And Hoyuk is the Turkish word for mound or tumulus. Uh, the name is derived from the fact that there were two hills separated by a dried up or diverted Karsamba st stream. Um, 
Now, take the name of that stream with a grain of salt. There is an e, um, there is a there is a much larger uh, Carsambra stream to the northeast in the peninsula. Uh, or it's more of a river than a stream, um, but I couldn't trace that it actually went that far south. Um, but the rivers and streams in this area are not that large, um, at least comparatively. But they do exist flowing down from the Taurus Mountains. So while the stream that Chapelhoyuk was originally founded around is no longer there, there are streams in the area. Um, but just keep in mind the naming for that is not 100%, at least that I could determine. It's not in a lot of the literature. Now, uh, again, it... Uh, it was located on two hills separated by this dried upstream. Uh, there is an eastern mound and a western mound. And the site was first discovered and excavated in 1958 by a man named James Mellart. He was an English archaeologist. And he led yearly excavations of the site between 1961 and 1965. Uh, these early excavations turned up around 150 structures. Um, some with very, you know, well-maintained um, interiors with whitewashed walls uh, that had paintings and plaster reliefs um, kind of molded over the walls. Um, there were also statues found of plaster and stone. Most of these depicted um, uh, a full-figured uh, corpulent female. Uh, the most famous of these was uh, or is known as the Seated Woman of Chatelhoyuk and it was a partially damaged figure around 17 centimeters which is like 6.7 inches long and 11 centimeters or 4.3 inches wide and it weighed around one kilo uh, which is 2.2 pounds. Um, she is sitting between two large uh, felines. Uh, they're either supposed to be um, uh, leopards, jaguars, mountain lions, panthers, something along those lines. Um, Mellart hypothesized that this was a depiction of a mother or, or earth or earth mother, goddess, some combination of all three. Um... Now, I plan on covering this idea or hypothesis in a more general episode, um, but this idea was not new, and a number of scholars in several fields had hypothesized an ancient religion based on the worship of a matronly figure. Um, this theory had uh, really entered um, in, I guess, like academic circles in the 50s, 60s, and I think in some cases... Like a rough idea of it had been even drawn up before then. But um, because of the discovery of Chattel Hoyuk and um, these uh, kind of professional uh, and academic discussions in the 50s, uh, this theory really entered into popular culture in the 60s and 70s um, after it got picked up by a number of... Um, second wave feminists, uh, hippies, and some generic neo-pagan groups who still worship some amalgamation of traits that some of the um, comparative mythologists said would have been part of this prehistoric religion. Uh, now Miller boldly and confidently claimed that because of the worship of the goddess uh, Chattelhoyuk was a matriarchal society, now, um, some of the evidence he cited for this was very spotty. And when I say some, I mean most of it. And when I say spotty, I mean he made it up. Um, he seems to have invented some old traditions and myths that were supposedly practiced you know, by later people in the region up out of whole cloth. And people called him out on this. And this controversy led to the Turkish government closing the site after 1965. 
And of course, it didn't help matters that after this, Mel Art was accused of being part of a ring that was smuggling artifacts out of the country. Uh, now, the ring, or something similar to it, did exist. And, um, or maybe even it still exists. But Mellert was acquitted of being part of it. However, he still was eventually expelled from the country permanently. And Chattelhoyuk excavation remained closed until the 1990s. Um, I think on the whole, this was probably a good thing because you see, uh, Mellert was not just accused of inventing myths, but also of inventing artifacts. And he very much muddled the water of what was and was not actually real about the places and uh, artifacts he discovered and worked on. In fact, after his death in 2012, his son and others published evidence showing that a number of his most controversial finds had been manufactured by Mel Art. Um, why he did this, I don't think anyone really knows for sure. Um, he was a legitimate archaeologist, and even if he had only ever found the items he didn't forge, um, he still would be considered one of the most prolific archaeologists of the age. Um, it's sorting out what he made up and what he hadn't has taken years to kind of figure out and resolve. So, um, you know, it's been a, it, it's very interesting reading about the man. Um, but, uh, with all of that table setting out of the way, um, we're now going to get into the specifics of the site that were not fabricated or overstated. Um, so, uh, first and foremost, permanent habitation of the site began as early as 7400 BC and no later than 7100 BC. So this is firmly in the pre-pottery Neolithic B time frame. Uh, the site will be abandoned by uh, no later than 100 years after the end of our current timeline that we're fo focusing on. Uh, so somewhere, somewhere between 6000 BC and about 5900 BC, BCE. Ah, but f overall, the site spanned about 32 uh, acres, um, and it contained a number of um, interesting artifacts, aside from the ones I had already laid out. Um, they found tr uh, pieces of obsidian uh, tools and weapons, which... Um, Obsidian is not located in this area. So that shows these people were trading with um, sites in Syria uh, and uh, others probably in southern Turkey. Uh, Marabit is one that we have, I think, mentioned before at this time frame. So it's very possible that they were uh, trading with people from some of those sites we had discussed prior. Or, the sites that were still around or uh, the people who had been living in that sites and abandoned them. Now, um, this is a site that is almost solely um, based, at least, um, well, I shouldn't say solely based, but it is a primarily, primarily agricultural site. Um, you find uh, a lot of different varieties of grain, um, you have wheat, barley, rye. Um, it's their primary food source. Though they did supplement it with some wild plants as well. Uh, and there are different types of animals. Um, I think sheep is the one that's the most important to these people. They probably used uh, the wool to help them create clothing. Um, you also see... Uh, cows introduced towards the end part of this period though um, bull horns and bull skulls have been located I think from uh, all through the time period that the site was occupied meaning that they were probably hunting wild bulls before 
uh, I guess, domesticated strains were introduced. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I mentioned that a lot of the figures they found, at least in that early excavation, were mostly female. Uh, this is true. However, in subsequent years after excavation restarted, they have found more and more figures of uh, not just females, but uh, masculine figures and figures uh, of bulls and other animals. So I think all in total, the females don't really outweigh the number of male statuary and paintings and things like that. Um, and again, there is also murals that have been found and mostly okay conditions. Some have been just mostly wiped away just due to the time that we're talking about. But um, we have found some evidence and examples of art that is not just uh, figurative. Um, also, uh, there was... Um, a, again, a large number of housing discovered. Um, I think at the peak, I've seen estimates range from about 5,000 to around 10,000 people would have lived at the location, um, which is staggering for the time frame we're talking about. Um, this would have been, um, if that's true, that, that would have been in line with a lot of the early cities that we'll be talking about in Samaria, southern uh, Mesopotamia. <clears throat> but again, this is a little bit of a controversy because this is all based on estimates. Um, but it is something that you should keep in mind. Um, and uh, the periods that, I guess, you can break Chattelhoyuk down to is you have an early period, a middle period, and a late period. Uh, the early period is uh, where people are just beginning to migrate into the area and start building these uh, domiciles. Um, this is, again, somewhere between 7400 to 7100 BC. Uh, and then... By the time you get to about 6,700, 6,500, that's when you see the population at its maximum. So you have somewhere between, you know, um, 600 years or so, give or take, um, to get to this very large population. And it caps out and then begins to collapse after around 200 to 300 years. Uh, and then, you know, that 6,500 or 6,500 BC to, you know, 5,900 or 6,000 BC, um, at that point you begin to see a steady and steep decline. Um, and we will get into why this happened. Um, obviously, it's not 100% known. But I do want to cover um, some similarities between Chattel Hoyuk and some of the other sites we've talked about. So, whereas, you know, Gobekli Tepe was thought initially to have just been kind of a ceremonial center um, with no domestic housing until much later, uh, or until, you know, more recently, I should say. Uh, Chattel Hoyuk has been thought of and still remains uh, to be thought of as a mostly um, residential location. There are no overt um, civic buildings. Um, there, uh, all the all the houses and rooms are around the same size. Some are slightly larger than others. Some have a little bit better decoration than others, um, but there. You know, there is no building that kind of stands out as like a palace center or a a kind of a, um, a central uh, central command building or something along those lines. Uh, so this has led many to kind of assume that Chattelhoyuk was kind of an egalitarian, communistic uh, society, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, 
but uh, and that has that has remained the same. There's never been any. This isn't a case of where after 20 years they have begun to excavate and have started to uncover buildings that um, were palace-esque structures. Um, and you can find under a lot of these houses they have that that traditional burial of uh, the you know ancestors underneath the floors of your uh, of your homes. Um, the homes also were square, which is a later PPNB type um, thing. You'd see at a lot of those sites. And like that uh, layer at Jericho, these houses are kind of built up next to each other. Although in this situation, some cases the houses are built on top of each other. Uh, some people have likened this to an anthill or a beehive, something kind of similar to that. So this city or settlement does not have a wall. There are no walls. What you have are these houses without doors. In fact, the only way to get in and out of these homes is via holes in the roof or holes from your neighbor's house. Um, there are a couple of interior, like courtyards, but you couldn't get to those from the outside. You'd have to get up to a house enter into the house, and then enter out in the courtyard through another location. Um, people were under the impression that they used ladders. Um, and they have actually, within the last year, actually found one of these ladders. Um, it's not what you or I would think of as a ladder. It's more along the lines of a log that has notches kind of carved into it, almost like a Lincoln log if you're familiar with those little wooden toys, except these would be more carved in like stairs. Um, and those would actually be used more as handholds, whereas the foot would actually kind of rest um, at the little spot above the notch uh, when you're walking down at least. Maybe going up, you'd actually put your foot in there to give yourself a little bit more force. Uh, and these would go up to the holes that would be cut in the roofs. And in fact, you would have a fire underneath those uh, holes kind of lit to kind of give you light and warmth. Um, and as you can imagine, this would cause a lot of soot built up uh, in uh, lungs and things like that. So these people probably had at least some level of respiratory issues, but it did make it so they would have to clean their houses very regularly. These are very well-maintained buildings. Um, so take of that benefit, uh, you know, the cost benefit of that is what you will. Also, um, I imagine if it started to rain very quickly, if a storm came out unexpectedly, you'd have to kind of barricade your roof very quickly. And I, I imagine people scrambling to get in. You know, you think about young children or old, the elderly, the sick, that you're having to care for, them having to get inside in a hurry. Um, I imagine that could have been a real pain in the ass <laughs> to try to, you know, get people inside and dry. Um... So, yes, uh, you have very traditional PPNB buildings in terms of shape. However, they have that innovation where they're kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, one thing that allowed them to do this is that they incorporated more wood frames into the mud brick that they were, they were making. So basically they would, they would use wood to kind of, um, with cross beams or just like extra... Uh, support for uh, ceilings and things like that, not to mention the wooden um, uh, ladders, step ladders that they would make. So you, you see an innovation there. Um, so we talked about the importance of art. Uh, I imagine that these people being mostly agriculture, uh, they do have these long periods where they're not having to do anything, especially in the winter. 
Uh, I imagine those that are not healthy enough to go out and hunt or tend animals, you know, they, they probably did have that leisure time to uh, relax and create art. Um, we don't see a lot of evidence of, um, you know, conflict with these people, at least with other sites. However, I do think um, they found around 100 skulls that they did a analysis of, and around 25 of those skulls they found showed evidence of healed fractures. Uh, and then there was 12 of them who had been, you know, who had been attacked more than once. With, um, I think, uh, then there are some that had uh, up to five injuries over a period of time. So, uh, this is not, you know, this is not a necessarily peaceful society, or at least this is not a society that is completely without dangers. Um, and I think more than half of the victims um, of this, you know, of these injuries were women. I think it was, uh, I think it was 13 women and 10 men. And then there were some younger skulls that they couldn't identify, you know, the gender of. Um, also, these people had uh, a lot of uh, problems you see with other early agriculture adopters. Their teeth were in very, very bad shape. Um, grain heavy diet. Um, at least in the earlier period, showed that there, you know, there's a lot more tooth decay that sets in. So this is this is one of the um, things that some call, sometimes called a disease of civilization. Um, with around, I think, of the adults that they found in the site, around 13% showed evidence of dental cavities. Um, also, the people. Um, in the later period, uh, from houses dated to the later period, um, they showed evidence that they had to work a lot more than the people who were living at the earlier period. Um, perhaps, um, well, well, we'll get into why that's the case um, probably in the next episode focusing on Chattahoyuk. Um, but... There, there are changes happening in this site. Um, be because of the early, um, the early findings there and some of the claims foot, put forth by James Mellart and other people um, like him, they envisioned that this was kind of a, a almost utopia, um, a, a society free of want and just had a lot of time at leisure and play um and they didn't have to worry about violence as much you know that kind of thing there 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 is a kind of a skewed view at chattel Hoyuk. not to say they were wrong about everything um or that uh even that they are wrong about some things but it, it's not as clear cut as they made it seem and part of you know part of that was people kind of uh, latching on to some of these ideas that Mel Art put forward with uh, just made up bullshit. So um, what we're going to do the next episode, I think I'm going to take it a little bit slow and kind of break down some changes that we see over time uh, and talk a little bit more about the supposed mother goddess religion and kind of why that was important to this sort of... Um, uh, this sort of idea of Chattel Hoyok. And uh, I think that'll be a good way to kind of finish off this. And we'll talk about what happened uh, to the people who abandoned Chattel Hoyok and why they abandoned Chattel Hoyok. Um, but yeah, I think this is a good place to start for now. Um, now, the next episode is actually not going to be part two of Chattel Hoyok. It's going to be a Kind of a special episode that I recorded a few weeks ago, um, back when we were recording the Go Beckley Tepe uh, episodes as well. 
Um, it's going to be just kind of a little friendly chat with a friend of mine who's um, who's knowledgeable about brewing beer. Uh, so that will come out next week. I'll set that up. I'm going to be out of town uh, for the weekend, and I will not be back Sunday evening the way I normally am when I leave town. Um, so to kind of keep, keep up episodes and get one out weekly, um, I'll release that kind of ahead of time. Uh, and then when we get back the following week, that week of the um, the, the 20th, um, we'll be back to Chattelhoyuk and finish that up. And then we'll, we'll continue on to um, the rest of Asia, or start to continue on to the rest of Asia. But I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. If you have any feedback or questions, please feel free to reach out to me at waradrevpod at gmail.com. Or you can reach me via direct message on Twitter, which I will include the link to uh, the Twitter account in the description as well. Uh, But I'd like to thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye.